I'm always fascinated when I come to Japan、um, looking at things like robots because I feel that probably more than any other culture in the world, the Japanese have this intrinsic fascination with all things robotic.、Uh, has that been your experience living here for the last seven years?、Uh, yeah, definitely. Japan is like a robot capital of the, of the world. And I think the fascination with robots here in Japan is、uh, long lasting. It started with the Astro Boy, right? <laughs> And since then, it's just、uh, growing.、Uh, they're trying to use robots as much as possible in industry, in the hospitality. And、uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, right? Cultural, economic,、uh, demographic reasons. So, yeah, it's.、Uh, Definitely the place to be if you want to do robots. I, I mean, you know, you can broadly define robots as well. Like, I'm convinced there's more intelligence in those toilets that I use here with all their functions, the noises. Like,、uh, I, I mean, they feel like kind of tiny robots themselves. True, robot. There is not no standard definition for a robot, so any like、uh, machine or device with some, some form of automation <laughs> or, or intelligence can be a robot. And、uh, why not? Robot toilets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here talking today with、uh, Marco Simic. Thank you for joining me today.、Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a real pleasure talking to someone in one of my, my favorite cities in the world. Thank you. So, let's talk a little bit about the, the state of the industrial robotics market.、Um, you know, obviously, there's been incredible progress over the last few years, but I'm still amazed not at how far the robotics market has come, but why we're not further.、Uh, because it seems sort of It seems crazy we don't have more automation in factories today. That is, that is true. We always hear how、uh, everything is getting automated and robots are everywhere, but the situation on the ground is not really like that.、Um, and adoption is probably a little bit slower than, than、uh, we can read in the media and, and、uh, internet and books.、Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that.、Uh, Primarily, it's,、uh, it's price.、Uh, robotic solutions and automation are still expensive, and not、uh, many businesses can actually afford、uh, fully automated、uh, production lines, right? So,、yeah. if you're a Toyota and you're like,、uh, you have an output of millions of cars per month, then sure, you can invest in automation and that will pay off.、Uh, but if you're a small and medium business, Sometimes it's hard to get the return on investment、uh, when it comes to the robotic solutions because robots are still expensive machines. And I guess it's interesting thinking about small and medium enterprises because,、uh, I mean, the other issue that even the very large corporations face is that traditionally robots have been quite、um, not only complex but kind of quite limited in the, in the tasks they could perform. So you'd have to have a very specialized robot that could do one thing very well. And I guess if you're a small medium enterprise, you sort of need a very flexible robot that can be trained on doing a whole number of different things. Yes, that is true.、Uh, traditionally, industrial robots were big,、uh, dangerous machines that have to be、uh, fenced off. You cannot work together with, with those robots, and they were good at, and they are good at just repeating one single trajectory many, many times over, right?、Uh, but、uh, a lot of manufacturing and logistics. Needs more flexibility, and also they have requirement to work to have humans and robots in the same space, right?、Uh, that's why we now have also collaborative robots that are able to work with, with humans. And, and、uh, you're right, if you have one static robot, even if it's not in a fence, right? Even if it's a collaborative robot, it's still a static robot, and it mostly does one or two operations, while when you have a human, It can do everything, right? So that, that, is,、uh, that is a challenge that a lot of、uh, new and innovative startups are trying to solve. Basically, we're building a new layer of intelligence that goes onto the more or less existing robots and, it, and enables them to work in the unstructured and more complex environments. <coughs> is, is this sort of akin to the moment where the, you know, the web and the internet transform the way we use computers? Um, it, it, it was the problem essentially that these robots were lacking kind of a common operating system or, or a kind of a way of networking them together?、Hmm. That is a good question.、Uh, I think that the problem is that not, not so much the operating system, but the intelligence layer, the capabilities layer, right? 
robots were traditionally not outfitted with cameras, for example. Right. And you cannot operate in real world if you don't see anything around you, right? So right now we're trying to put cameras on the robots and additional sensors. Uh, and then using that information, we can control robots uh, much better. And by, by controlling robots, I mean AI is controlling them, right? Right. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's sort of strange because, you know, a few years back, um, there was a big talk about Industry 4.0. It was going to be this sort of tsunami of innovation of sensors and data and AI. Uh, but from what you're saying, it, it feels like uh, the kind of that robotic automation piece is still lagging that vision. Uh, I, my opinion is that it, it is still lag, lagging. Uh, automation is definitely the future and necessary, and we experienced that uh, during COVID, right? When everybody was locked down, everything was shut down, right? We didn't have people to work. Yeah. So we definitely need robots and automation. And there were some amazing improvised robots creating during that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so automation is definitely the way forward, but the, the pace is still not uh, very, very fast. Uh, some of the biggest um, robotics firms in the world are here in Japan, um, but China is also making big investments. What, what, what do you see as stylistically the differences between the Japanese approach to robotics and automation versus the Chinese? I don't have a very good insight into Chinese market, but I do know that uh, robotics is one of their top priorities in their, they make those like 15 year plans or something or five yeah. year plans. And robotics and AI is always one of the top priorities and uh, they're investing a lot of money into their own startups into their own technology so they want to have domestic manufacturing of those robots and also of, of AI Japan also has the the AI and robotics as a priority but uh, China is more centralized than the generally when they put their mind on something they, they go very hard <laughs> Is, is, is format going to be an issue? Uh, I mean, uh, there was sort of that um, almost comical um, announcement of the humanoid robot by Elon Musk. Uh, and there's been some other startups creating these sort of, I mean, frankly, terrifying humanoid ro ro robots. Uh, do you think form factor is, is a big issue or do you think that's mainly just sort of the public's perception of what a robot should be? Uh, so, robots, humanoid robots are good uh, if you want them to work in uh, in human environments, right? Because human environments are are made for humans, and if you have a robot that's kind of human, it's going to be easier for them. But if you have a a factory that's kind of designed with automation in mind, then you can go with some simpler solutions and and not humanoid robots. Uh, I do think that humanoid robots uh, are still at least 10 years away, <laughs> right. but maybe I'm making a bad prediction here. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I mean, I think it would be helpful for those who don't have a manufacturing background. I mean, when you imagine what a, a, a an advanced factory in 2030 looks like, you know, where automation is, you know, implemented to, to the nth degree, what does that look like? Because I mean, I, I kind of, there was sort of that moment in the in the late industrial revolution when you know, Henry Ford and electricity allowed us to design more decentralized distributed factories. What is the 2030s highly automated factory start to, to resemble? I, I think that the holy grail of automation is lights off factories, basically where you don't need any lights and no humans inside and everything is fully automated. Right. You have mobile robots carrying the materials, you have robotic arms, moving stuff and automated machine. So from a material input to the product output, everything should be fully automated. But uh, I don't think we'll, we'll have that in 2030. <laughs> Why? Um, there, are, there are unsolved challenges when it comes to uh, robot control and perception. Right. And uh, you said before that humans can do many things, right? And many unexpected things happen in factories uh, and as a human you can deal with that but as a robot it's sometimes hard to deal with the uh, unexpected situations so you could potentially design a bespoke lights off factory that made one thing as long as that one thing never changed but if it was going to be a multi-modal multi-purpose factory that's when things get much more difficult right? yeah I would say so yeah 
And 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 in so in in that sort of model where you have that sort of multi-purpose factory of the future, um, you know, do do you think you essentially have um, a, a variety of different uh, formats of robot? I mean, you've got sort of arms and grippers and. You yeah. know, what, what are sort of the, the, the different varieties of robots? So two most common types of robots are robotic arms. Yeah. And you've seen those robots mostly like when they're building cars. Uh, and then mobile robots. So mobile robots uh, are more or less autonomous vehicles, like autonomous cars, right? But, but they just operate in, in factories. Uh, and they usually carry materials from one station to another. And then you have uh, robotic arms that manipulate those uh, materials. They do insertion or uh, machine insertion or pick and place operations or the fulfillment and stuff like that. So, so I'm trying to think what the, you know, what the big advance is going to be when you have that format. I, I mean, presumably you now, I, I mean, if you think about factories today, even if they're highly automated, they run on lines, you know, you can't really move those lines around. They're hard to mm -hmm. reset up. But it, 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 you could actually have a more agile factory than if you just really had mobile units and, and arms, right? That is true. For example, a lot of factories right now uh, use conveyor belts and uh, st fixed equipment, right? But yeah. you could use mobile robots uh, more instead of those uh, those conveyor belts. So it's not fixed, and then you can change the layout uh, pretty quickly. I I'm thinking about you know you ever seen that video from Mercado, you know where they have the hive, you know? Where, oh yeah, yeah. Where you've got those sort of like it's sort of like this weird honeycomb of, of yeah. They have a great system. Yeah. I like it a lot. But it's sort of. It's not. It's not like someone said. Let's take a, a normal warehouse and automate it. They said, "Well, what can? A, what does a warehouse? What could yeah, it be?" It has to be built from scratch like that. That's yeah. true. It is uh, generally hard to outfit the existing old uh, factory with uh, novel robotic solutions. It takes a lot of uh, retooling and changes to add new lines and uh, automate existing lines. Let's talk a little bit about that intelligence layer that, that, that you mentioned before. And, and I think, um, you know, we've seen incredible advances in uh, not even just the last couple of years, the last couple of months, you know, w when it comes to uh, these large language models and transformers. Um, w where do you see the intersection between the advances that have been made of generative AI with things like industrial automation? I, I mean, is there a link or, or are these really just going to be used for, you know, generating uh, images and, uh, you know, people no, writing so spam emails. <laughs> <laughs> so there is definitely a link and we already seen some, some research in that direction. Uh, not so much with uh, image generation, but more with like language model, the language generation, right? right? And it can be used in, in several ways. Uh, one way is just as an inter interface uh, with a robot, right? So robot can respond to you basically right, right. Uh, with those models or you can use those large lang language models to translate uh, human commands into some commands that uh, robots can understand better right and the uh, another application is uh, to use these large language models for simple grounding uh, in their learning procedures so that means that uh, when AI learns on data, it can connect concepts and words, right? So it can know that when when they're picking a bottle, it knows, okay, this is really a bottle and bottle is like, means this and it's connected to words like- well, Like glass right? and breakable. And exactly, right. right. So there is definitely an intersection in use case for these large models with, uh, with robots. I mean, potentially, I, I mean, I, I saw with the latest release of GPT-4, it was multimodal. So it could actually take images as, um, as input. Um, and, and you were talking before about, you know, putting cameras on these industrial robots. I mean, could this mean that eventually you could combine those multimodal capabilities with, with computer vision and kind of give these robots a sense of what the world is at a kind of a symbolic yes, level? Definitely. So um, part of the robot, most of the robots, uh, at this point are are outfitted with cameras right but the image that they're getting is just being processed with in a more simple way we're still right. using some machine learning some deep learning to process those images to get like uh, bounding bo boxes on humans or like segmentation masks or stuff like that but yeah by adding more powerful ai you'll get uh, better reasoning capabilities of those robots 
Right. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, it'd be useful for people who are not familiar to understand, you know, just how much we've advanced, you know, in this kind of version one to version two, version three of, you know, of, of software engineering. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So there is a informal uh, classification of software uh, to software 1.0, 2.0 and now emerging 3.0 and uh, software 1.0 was basically a traditional way to write software by just humans writing the code. Right. Uh, software 2.0 was uh, a combination of human written uh, programs and also uh, data created programs, right? Basically, you create a machine learning algorithm that learns on data and that represents a, a program, right? So it's a combination of what the human writes and what is made out of some data. And then uh, software 3.0 is basically uh, machines writing code. <laughs> right. And, and the current systems like GPT-3 and 4 can actually write uh, pretty good code. And, and this, the, the outputs are the same in terms of the, 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 the yeah, software. Yeah, uh, code is code, yeah. It doesn't right. matter who writes it, human, robot, or, or a dog. <laughs> you know, I, I've, seen, um, I've seen even human programmers use tools like Copilot. And, yeah. and what's fascinating um, is that they're less, it's less of a, at this point, it's less of an autocomplete for the code that they're writing. And it's almost like they're actually describing what the program needs to do at a strategic level, and, and the software is actually then being written. So it, it can be used in, in both ways. Uh, one is very smart auto completion, so it can complete your functions, it can complete your documentation, but you can also tell it, okay, I need this, this, and this, and it will try to generate the code for that. But in that mode, uh, the results are still not uh, perfect, yes. and it's very dangerous to just rely on that. But, yeah. but but you think conceptually that's where like oh, yeah, longer term that, that, that yeah. that's where I mean being an advanced program in the future is yeah can be and quite that different. future will probably be next year <laughs> <laughs> GPT five probably and that's it <laughs> so I mean if you if you bring in sort of robotics in the broad sense there of kind of AI within factories or, or um, organizations um, at some point it doesn't necessarily need to be a human creating that seed right I mean, essentially the the, the systems themselves can al almost self-seed. Uh, that is true. So w one thing that these new large language models can do is basically use existing software, right? So most software that humans write uh, have uh, APIs, basically instructions how to use those programs through code, right? right? And these large language models can already use those APIs to control the software, right? So you can imagine the future in which you just have a bunch of these AIs interacting with different software and, and using them for, for different things. I mean, literally RTFM, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the machines are going to do yeah, it. Yeah. Because, um, you know, if we think about the early stages of automation, it was sort of robotic process automation was essentially just using, you know, machines to do what you could um, easily describe a human's task to do. But if machines can essentially, as you say, have APIs into our software, understand their use, potentially the way they use them will be radically different to the way a human might. That is a possibility. I didn't think about that, but yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> even when DeepMind was training the systems to play, you know, like Breakout, yeah. they, they, they would inevitably find a way to win that was actually very unhuman. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, so there's definitely danger in, in just letting these AI systems uh, loose in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, we were talking about AI safety before, actually, and th this kind of relates to that. I, I mean, what, uh, and I know you're involved in this area um, in, in, in Tokyo. W what does AI safety mean, actually, in practical terms? Because I mean, I'm assuming we're not talking about Terminators and John and Connor and. N not yet, at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, right now, it mostly means uh, overcoming bias. Uh, in these models, right? So we want to mo we want models to be fair and unbiased, so they don't like uh, insult and harm people. Uh, but in the long term, we want to align them better with human values. As these robots become, these uh, AI systems become more capable and more autonomous, uh, we need them to. Uh, 
believe in human values and respect human values, right? Because if they don't, then we can have very weird and unpleasant situations in which they would do something that would not be good for humans, right? I mean, even that concept of human values is 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 not without controversy. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's strange, but um, you know, even Elon Musk the other day was talking about he wants to build Truth GPT. Yeah. You know, like his version based on another uh, another set of um, subjective facts. Um, so, so what what how, how do we program values into machines when we can't agree on them? Ourselves? It is it is an, <laughs> an extremely hard hard problem without without a solution at the present moment. As as you said, even human values are not uh, same in every region of of the world, right? So whose va- whose values should the robot respect? Uh, it's a very complicated issue. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating, right? It's almost like you've, you've crossed uh, a border and. You sort of you no need to be careful because the robots operate on a different yeah. um, ethical operating system. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that would not be good. <laughs> um, a lot of smart people are trying to solve this. Uh, it's still early days, and hopefully, we'll uh, we'll manage to come up with solutions in time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean this, uh, and I think this is the challenge even for regulators now. You know, who are trying to look at this. I mean, th- th- there was this, there was a hilarious conversation in the EU a couple of years back where they were trying to tax robots. Yeah. You know, as a way of protecting existing labour. I mean, I think we're almost still using the constraints of our old world to try and understand this new, uh, this new opportunity. Uh, we are definitely moving into some strange waters with with the robots and AI. Uh, in like five to ten years when we're s- surrounded by them, when we have them interact with each other, it is just going to be a different situation. We'll have, we will need new regulation, we will ne- need new new paradigm basically. And EU is right now trying to, to uh, vote on the AI Act. They're trying to put into law how to basically ensure safety and how businesses that build AI systems need to conduct themselves, how they handle data, how they certify that AI systems are correct and things like that. I think the problem is most of that was written before ChatGPT was released. <laughs> so, so this particular act, it's called AI Act actually, is uh, in the parliament right now and it's been written right now. So they're taking into account all this uh, a new situation on the ground. So hopefully, uh, it will be a decent uh, solution. Yeah, I mean, you 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 were talking before about co-robotics. You know, like human beings working alongside machines. You know, in in the work you've done and, and where you've seen this implemented, what, what what is that ideal relationship? Like, I mean, what is it that you know, even in a factory, a human can do best versus what a robot should be doing? Uh, right now, humans. Are adaptable, right? They are opposable thumbs, right? <laughs> uh, sure, it's it's <laughs> our hands, right? We are very dexterous, more flexible, more adaptable. But it's also our cognitive powers, right? We are still much smarter than robots, and we understand the world much better than the robots. So, human can do almost any task that you throw at them, right? Right. While uh, current robots are still really very restricted in what they can do. They usually do one or two operations and that's pretty much it. Uh, in the future that will change, especially when we get to the uh, humanoid robots, right? Uh, they'll, they'll be able to do more. They'll also have like robotic hands that they can, they will be able to manipulate any, any object that was made for humans, like be it like uh, plates or cups, mugs, whatever. And hopefully that learning will be transferable then, right? Like if, if, if one robot in one part of the factory learns something, it can update all the others. Yeah, that there are different ways how to, to organize that, but sure, that sharing the knowledge is, is part of it, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the, there are, the distinction between collaborative and industrial robots is right now that obviously collaborative robots are safe to work with humans. But on the downside is that they're usually um, slower, they have a, a smaller payload that they can carry, and they're also less uh, repeatable in their motions. Right. So you have a trade-off right now. If you need high precision, uh, high throughput, you would go for industrial robots, right? Right. But if it's very important for your operation to be 
like uh, human friendly and for robots to work with humans, then collaborative robots are the only solution. I, I'm kind of uh, the reason why I'm asking this as well is because I'm trying to understand what the f the future of the human is in this context. I mean, there was this moment if you look at the history of the industrial revolution where you know where they started bringing heavy machinery in, say, the cotton industry. You know, um, a lot of those textile workers, especially in the United States, they didn't lose their jobs. They essentially started to maintain the machinery yeah. instead. So I'm just wondering what the 21st century, you know, co co worker. I mean, this, once we go beyond dexterity. Are they sort of like the programmers in Copilot who are essentially teaching the robot um, or, you know, like the old Toyota factory workers, the Kaizen, you know, yeah. they're, they're trying to look for smarter ways to organize production. So I hope that it will be like that, but it might not be like that actually, yeah. because with both advancements in, in hard robotic hardware and uh, AI systems, uh, we're Man we're able to automate more and more processes, right? So at some point, robots and AI systems will be able to do almost anything that humans can do, right? It's not gonna be in, in five years or, or 20 years, right? But down the line, it is going to be like that. So uh, m most people will probably work in the ser service industry where human interaction is very important, while all the other industrial work and dangers and stuff work and things like that will be completely offloaded to to robots uh, depending on economics i sure. i mean <laughs> I, I saw a i saw a picture just the other day of like i think it was in wuhan of a delivery person using an exoskeleton oh wow okay. and i just thought i mean clearly there was an economic trade-off here like a, a human being a drone or a human being with an exoskeleton you know that that was the most cost effective yeah which is why they built it otherwise it wouldn't would never have been true, done true but, to, uh, and the economics is a uh, big reason why we still don't have like that huge adoption of, of industrial robots in every factory because they're still still expensive. So if you were in, um, you know, in a leader in the manufacturing industry today um, and you wanted to, or in retail or logistics, and you wanted to you know, make some first steps that you were going to get the biggest return off, where would you focus your attention? I mean, which, which problems do you think you know, whether it's AI or computer vision, where, where is sort of the low hanging fruit today? Uh, well, it, it would all depend on the actual manufacturing processes that you have in your, in your uh, uh, factories, right? But uh, automating boring and repetitive tasks is always uh, good and easily done at this point. Also automating uh, manipulation of heavy load is is good and doable like big boxes big like uh, car chassis and stuff like that uh, uh, material uh, transportation is also something that we can automate easily at this point while uh, any work that needs more dexterity and creativity and has like assembling iPhones ex exactly right that still uh, that still requires a little bit of human touch I would say but not for long <laughs>